Ladies and gentlemen, we are just weeks away from the SpaceX Starship Super Heavy actually being ready to go to space. This orbital test flight promises to be one of the most significant events in aerospace history. Not only will it be the most powerful rocket ever launched, but it will also be the most ambitious spaceflight in decades. We haven't really seen an original design for a space vehicle make it to orbit since the first launch of the space shuttle back in 1981, and now 40 years later, we have a new spaceship that is designed to accomplish feats that no other before it has been able to do. So with SpaceX Starship and Super Heavy reaching nearly final completion of their first orbital launch candidates, let's take some time and run through everything we know so far about how this rocket works and what it's going to be used for. We are really excited that today's video is sponsored by our awesome partner, Omaze again. We'll let you know how you can enter for your chance to win a Tesla Model S Plaid. Yes, you heard that right, Model S Plaid, a little later in the video. The muscle of the Starship is in its first stage, the Super Heavy. This booster is basically a 69 meter high tube filled with rocket fuel, engines, and plumbing. Lots of plumbing. The body of the Super Heavy is mostly just a series of stainless steel rings that are all stacked on top of each other and fused together. This is one of many engineering decisions that SpaceX have made to make this vehicle as quick and easy to build as possible. At the bottom of the Super Heavy is the massive thrust puck. This steel plate holds the mounts for all 29 of the Raptor engines that will power the launch vehicle and the gimbal system that will allow the booster to maneuver, plus all of the plumbing and wiring that is needed to make them work. With all of the pipes installed, the thrust section kind of looks like a big wheel with a ton of thin spokes. The engines of the Super Heavy are positioned very strategically within the thrust section. There are 20 Raptors solid mounted in a ring around the outside of the puck to provide constant vertical thrust. The inner ring of eight Raptors are gimbaled, which means they are attached to a motorized system that can control the pitch and yaw of the engine nozzle. This operation is called thrust vectoring, and that's how SpaceX will control the angle of the rocket. We've seen this process at work during the landing burn of the Starship SN prototypes. The gimbaled engines guide the ship into a vertical landing position. Then there is one last Raptor in the very center of the thrust section that is also on a gimbal. My guess is that this one is going to be primarily responsible for landing control. Moving up, the entire body section of the Super Heavy is basically just fuel tanks. The Raptor engines are powered by a combination of liquid methane and liquid oxygen, so the booster has to carry a massive tank full of each element. To keep both of these gases in their liquid state, they must be held at super cold cryogenic temperatures within the storage tanks. The fuel capacity of the booster is thought to be around 3,400 tons. And then at the top of the booster are the four grid fins. In the original renderings of the Super Heavy, these were imagined to be kind of diamond shaped and retractable. But SpaceX has settled on a much more simplified design for the orbital booster. They are now just simple welded steel rectangles that are about the size of a car and solid mounted to the outer wall. The purpose for these fins is to help steer the booster during its return to the ground while also creating aerodynamic drag. And then finally, the fins will be used as a contact point for the Mechazilla launch tower that will catch the booster as it comes in for landing. More on that in a bit. Omaze has partnered with the charity Reverb and by donating $10, you'll be entered for the chance to win a Tesla Model S Plaid. You already know all about the Tesla Model S Plaid, so let's dive into the amazing charity you'll be supporting with your donation. Reverb partners with musicians, festivals, and venues to green their concerts while engaging fans face-to-face -face at shows to take environmental and social action. Their work makes a real positive impact on the environment, including the elimination of 3 million plus single-use plastic water bottles at concerts, supporting 2,000 family farmers, elevating the work of 4,000 local and national nonprofits, 
and eliminating over 180,000 tons of CO2 through their music climate revolution campaign. And just in case you need a refresh on the Tesla Model S Plaid, the vehicle has a nearly 400 mile range, zero to 60 in under two seconds with more than 1000 horsepower and a top speed of 200 miles per hour. To potentially win a Tesla Model S Plaid and support reverb, go to amaze.com slash the Tesla space or click the link in the description. We're wishing you the best of luck and hope one of you wins. Thanks again to Omaze for supporting the channel. Let's get back to the video. The actual ship part of the Starship is the second stage of the rocket. This is the part that will fly through space, deliver payloads to orbit, and eventually land on the moon and Mars. The cool thing about the Starship is that it can be configured to suit any kind of mission, people, satellites, rovers, telescopes, probes, anything you can imagine putting into space, the Starship can do it. Need to land on the moon? Starship can do it. Going to Mars? Starship is how you'll get there. When it comes to payload, this will be the highest capacity space vehicle ever made. The cargo variant of the Starship will open like a clamshell at the top, revealing a payload fairing that is 9 meters in diameter and 18 meters high. By comparison, the Falcon 9 payload fairing is 13 meters long and 5.2 meters in diameter. That equals out to a massive difference in capacity. For comparison, SpaceX is currently able to launch 60 of their Starlink satellites from the fairing of the Falcon 9, but they are expecting that the Starship will up that capacity to 400 satellites carried to orbit on every launch. It's estimated that Starship will be able to carry over 100 metric tons of cargo weight into low Earth orbit. Meanwhile, the Falcon Heavy, SpaceX's current most powerful launch vehicle, is down at just 64 metric tons of capacity. So that's very important to keep in mind. This isn't just a step forward, this is literally a giant leap in spaceflight capability. The Starship comes with its own crew of Raptor engines that are also fueled by tanks of subcooled liquid methane and oxygen, just like the booster. Starship has just six engines on board. The outer ring of three solid mounted engines are the vacuum variant of the Raptor. These are optimized for use in the vacuum of space with much larger thrust nozzles. The inner group of three are the same engines found on the Super Heavy and are also attached to a gimbal for control of the angle of the rocket during landing. The vacuum Raptors will power the Starship into its orbital position after separating from the booster. We've recently found out that Elon is hoping to keep this separation mechanism as simple as possible. So instead of using a spring pusher or any of the other common and complex systems that would usually handle this job of separating the two stages, Elon's idea is that the super heavy engines will gimbal just before shutting down to create a rotation before the latches between the two release. The energy of the rotation will cause the two stages to drift apart. The much heavier Starship will continue on a linear path while the booster flips to begin its vertical descent. The most innovative aspect about Starship is that in addition to being a second stage rocket, it is also a lander. We know that SpaceX can land and reuse the first stage booster of their Falcon 9. That's become pretty standard. But recovering the second stage is a much more complicated situation. Of course, there was the space shuttle. That was a spaceship that could land and be reused, but that was more like a space plane than a rocket. It's not really comparable with the Starship. It's like an apples and oranges kind of thing. After deploying its payload, the Starship will re-enter Earth's atmosphere belly side down, which will be covered with hexagon shaped heat shield tiles. Once the ship is back in the atmosphere, it will use fins located at the nose and tail to maintain a controlled glide. It's kind of the same way that a skydiver comes down, using their arms and legs to control the descent. Once near the ground, the gimbaled Raptor engines fire to angle the Starship so that it's straight up and down, and they slow the vehicle down to land on its extendable legs. Okay, quick break. Did you know that we have a second YouTube channel dedicated entirely to space exploration content just like this? So if you like this, check out the Space Race for more information on SpaceX, Starship, and the next generation of human space exploration. So we know that Starship will be used for delivering massive payloads into orbit around the Earth. But another feature that sets this apart from any other spaceship is the Starship's ability to land on other planets and then take off again. 
The primary goal for the Starship is to eventually land on Mars. That's Elon's grand dream for the project and for humanity as a whole, to land on Mars and build a settlement there. Hell, it could happen as early as 2024 in a perfect world, but more likely we're looking at a Mars window of 2026. However, in the meantime, Starship is scheduled for a trip to the moon. Or maybe not. This was supposed to be the part of the video where we talk about the Starship human landing system for NASA's first Artemis mission to the moon. It's supposed to be the first human mission back to the moon and the beginning of a new era of research and exploration beyond Earth's orbit. But thanks to the ongoing meddling of Lex Luthor and his Blue Origin company, the lunar lander Starship is now in its second delay of the year. The project should be well on its way right now, but instead it has not even gotten started. It's a whole big thing that we're not going to get into here, but it's starting to look like the Martian Starship might actually happen before the Lunar Starship, and honestly, that's pretty sad. But visiting other planets is what Starship was built to do. So how does that work? Well, if a Starship isn't going back to Earth from orbit, it can go the other way, but first it will need more fuel. A lot of fuel. This is the thing that a lot of people are really hung up on right now. Before Starship can go anywhere, it will need to connect with a tanker ship that will be pretty much the exact same vehicle, just totally filled with rocket fuel. Unfortunately, for the tanker to reach the Starship in orbit, it has to burn that fuel. So by the time they actually get to refilling, there's not a whole lot left. And that's why we have this need for multiple filling sessions before Starship is ready to continue its journey. We're probably looking at a minimum of four refills just to reach the moon, and obviously a hell of a lot more than that to reach Mars. Okay, there's a third big piece to this whole Starship puzzle, and that's the launch slash landing tower that Elon has gone ahead and nicknamed Mechazilla. I think he just had watched the new Godzilla vs. King Kong movie, and I guess it really stuck with him. I don't know. The launch tower is where the two stages of Starship will be stacked on top of each other using a giant crane and then readied for liftoff. This tower is built in pretty much the same way as the Starship, just a bunch of sections all stacked on top of each other and welded together. The tower reaches a height of about 145 meters, so about 25 meters taller than the fully stacked Starship. But like we said, this is not only a launch tower, but eventually it should become a landing tower as well. Elon is committed to the idea that his Mechazilla will be able to catch the super heavy booster on its way back down to Earth, and this is really smart thinking from SpaceX. The idea is that as the booster comes down past it, the tower will extend two arms that will catch underneath the fins, and then a hydraulic system will gently cradle the whole thing down to a stop before touching the ground. The booster should be coming in extremely slowly for this whole process. Unlike the Falcon 9, the Super Heavy will be able to throttle down until its thrust ratio is just 1 to 1. Essentially, it can hover. Falcon 9 relies on burning the engine at just the right time so that its velocity reaches zero at the exact moment that it hits the ground. If that timing is off at all, then it either smashes into the ground and explodes or starts to lift back up again and falls over. If the Super Heavy can hover, then why does it need to be caught though? Well, the catching arms eliminate the need for any kind of extendable legs to be built into the booster section, which greatly simplifies the design and also reduces the weight. It also reduces the amount of time and labor that might be required between launches. Elon's idea is that Starship will launch multiple times per day once the project gets going at full speed. And that means that they really don't have time to move the booster from a landing pad back to the launch pad. With Mechazilla, it will catch the booster and then immediately start placing it back on the launch stand again. Then it picks up a new Starship vehicle, places it on top, refuels the whole thing, and boom, back into space we go. So the whole system is designed to be in a constant state of motion. Boosters come down, ship goes up, over and over again, day in and day out. So when people freak out about the idea that a starship would have to be refueled four times to reach the moon, well sure, right now that might take a while to do, but once they get into the rhythm of things, SpaceX will be able to complete that process in just a couple of days. No big deal. 
And that leads us into the grand plan for a whole fleet of Starship vehicles waiting in orbit around the Earth for their window to Mars. Of course, even in the best case scenario, it will take a while to launch and refuel a whole interstellar convoy of these ships, but it's going to go one hell of a lot faster than most people are able to imagine right now. So that's the Starship as we know it today. Unfortunately, we're still going to be waiting a few weeks, maybe even months before we get to see this thing launch into orbit. It's hard to say exactly what the timeline will be, but we know we have a lot of time to kill before anything happens. Be sure to let us know in the comments section what your thoughts are on the Starship, what implications do you think this will have for human spaceflight, and most importantly, what year do you think we're going to Mars? If you enjoy this kind of content about space and human spaceflight in general, then you would probably really like our new sister channel called The Space Race. Check it out and let us know what you think, link down below in the description. And if you want to continue to learn about everything regarding Tesla, SpaceX, and Elon Musk, we've got two more video options for you on the screen to check out. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up today if you liked it, and subscribe to our channel for weekly content just like this.